My name is Deborah Gessner. I'm with the Florida Holocaust Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. However, I live in Lakewood Ranch, so I feel I'm part of Sarasota. I am very pleased to introduce to you not only the number one international best-selling author today, John Loftus, but a personal friend as well. John graduated from Boston Latin, undergraduate Boston College, has his postdoctoral uh, Juris Doctor work at Suffolk in Georgetown. After graduating from school, he went into the Army. He was in the Intelligence Division of the Army and fought and helped them in the Yom Kippur's War. When he was done in the Army, he was uh, accepted a position in the Carter and Reagan administration in the Justice Department. He was one of the founding attorneys in the Office of Special Investigations that was created for the review of Nazi war criminals living in America. He has appeared on 60 Minutes, Primetime Live. He has appeared on most major networks, CNN, all of them. He is probably one of the greatest recognized authorities on this subject in the world today. In fact, what is interesting, when we were in Washington in September, uh, the current head of Office of Special Investigations for the Justice Department met with us, Eli Rosenblum, and he was John's law clerk when John started with the Justice Department in the 70s. I'm also pleased to state that he was the Alfred nominee for the Pulitzer Pri Surprise uh, for the uh, Pulitzer Prize Award. Uh, the book was called The Bolaris Secret, so if you have not had a chance to read that, it is a phenomenal book. Please join us in welcoming John Loftus. We are very pleased to have him with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I always get teased. Doesn't it seem a little bit silly to have an Irish Catholic writing books about Jews, Nazis, and Israel? My mother was born in Ireland, and she had an explanation. She said there was an ancient Irish legend that the Irish are the lost tribe of Israel. <laughs> My dad shook his head and said, John, it couldn't possibly be true that we're related because the Jews can't drink and the Irish can't cook. My association is much more mundane. I was a young, ambitious lawyer. I had a great job. I worked for the Attorney General of the United States. And President Carter asked us for volunteers among the Justice Department lawyers to set up a new task force to investigate whether there were any Nazis hiding in America. Now, since I knew absolutely nothing about the subject, I, of course, immediately volunteered. Well, I thought it would look good on my resume. I thought I might get a free trip to Germany out of it. Instead, my boss discovered that I had some intelligence training when I was an army officer, although everyone thinks military intelligence is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> Nevertheless, that was the qualification that got me the most unusual job in the U.S. government. They raised my security clearances many levels above top secret. My job was to go through all the CIA and NATO intelligence archives for several years, to see if I could find any clues to where there might be Nazis hiding in America. Well, I never did get my free trip to Germany. Instead, I got lots of free trips to Suitland, Maryland. Now, Suitland is a nice little town. It's right outside Washington, D.C. And Suitland is where the U.S. government buries its secrets, literally. There are 20 storage vaults underground. Each vault is one acre in size. Have you ever seen the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? Well, the last scene of that movie is what the underground vaults are really like, only not as organized as they are in the movie. <laughs> and being a typical man, I didn't always stop and ask for directions. And uh, one day I got really lost and ended up all the way down in the Q vault where our nuclear warfare documents are stored. And inside the nuclear vault, I stumbled across a group of Nazi files, files that I wasn't supposed to see files that no one was supposed to see until the year 2015. And I discovered, much to my embarrassment, that many of the Nazis that I had been assigned to prosecute were already on the government payroll. It was one of those Cold War operations that got all messed up. The British Secret Service had a private meeting with a few chaps from our State Department intelligence. And the British said, look, the Germans are defeated now, the Russians are the new enemy. We have to get ready for World War III. 
And the British were going to recruit people from all across Eastern Europe, secretly bring them to America for training, and send them back behind the Iron Curtain as freedom fighters. So that if World War III ever erupted, we would have an underground army of freedom fighters behind Russian lines. Now, the only problem with the whole freedom fighter project was that the chap in charge of it in Britain was named Kim Philby. Oh, I see some of you get the joke already. Kim Philby, we discovered to our horror years later, Kim Philby was the highest ranking communist spy ever to infiltrate the British Secret Service. So naturally, Kim Philby was following his orders from Moscow. He wasn't sending anti-communists to America. He was sending us the dregs of the Nazi war criminals of Eastern Europe. And our State Department was too stupid and too gullible to realize they were being conned. Until finally, when Philby showed up at a press conference in Moscow in 1963, our bureaucrats do what all good bureaucrats do. They buried their mistakes. They hadn't told the CIA or the President or Congress what the State Department had done. Now, the State Department couldn't destroy all the top secret Nazi documents because it literally takes too much paperwork to destroy a top secret file. <laughs> but you can misfile them. That's why all the Nazi files ended up down in the nuclear vaults where no one was supposed to find them until I was stupid enough to stumble across them some four decades later. I looked at some of the famous American names who had been innocently involved with this freedom fighter project. I knew it would be a huge scandal, but uh, maybe I'm a thick-headed Irishman, but I figured that my dad's generation didn't fight World War II to make America safe for Nazi retirement. <laughs> but I followed the law. I went to the CIA and the Pentagon, and I asked all the intelligence agencies for legal permission to go public. A lot of people may knock America, but you live in one of the few countries in the world that has the guts to admit its mistakes and correct them. And I was very, very proud of my country the day the CIA called the Justice Department and said that I had permission to speak. Now, what do you do when you have a crazy story like this? Nazis in America. I pick up the phone and I call 60 Minutes. <laughs> we had a great time. Mike Wallace gave me 30 minutes on his show. It's the longest segment that 60 Minutes has ever done. And when the episode about Nazis in America went on the air back in 1982, it caused a minor national uproar. Congress demanded hearings. Mike Wallace got the Emmy Award. My family got the death threats. It was a great trade-off. <laughs> but I figured I'd done my Boy Scout duty. I left Washington and I went back and joined the largest corporate law firm in Boston. Time to get on with my life. But then a funny thing happened. It seemed as if every retired intelligence agent in NATO started showing up at my law firm. They all had these wonderful stories to tell, because I, I guess there weren't many lawyers running around who had had SI and cosmic security clearances. So the deal is they could talk to me anonymously under the attorney private, client privilege, but my legal requirements are every book I write has to be submitted first for censorship through the intelligence community. So I was a safe middleman for many men and women in the intelligence community who wanted to be whistleblowers but do it legally. And they had some amazing stories to tell. Um, one of the stories that I was not allowed to write about in my first book was how the Nazis actually got to America from Europe. And the CIA said, no, 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 no. you can't ever write about the Vatican. Uh, I'm an Irish Catholic. And this, well, when they told me I couldn't write about it, it only annoyed me. So as a good lawyer, I found the loophole. We had a young... Um, a British kid who spoke fluent Serbo-Croatian. Now I knew that the Vatican had actually had a network of Croatian Catholic priests who had set up a rat line, a smuggling system for the British Secret Service. And so the Nazis would go from Germany to Austria. There was a whole network of convents and monasteries that would take them down to Rome, to the port of Genoa, where ships were chartered to sail them to Australia or Latin America or Canada, eventually to the United States. So my uh, young friend went around with a tape recorder posing as a young Croatian fascist. And these old priests bragged into this tape recorder how the smuggling program had worked. Then I went back to CIA and said, look, they blew the whistle on themselves. You can't stop me now. So it was, it was lots of fun. We got all sorts of documents declassified, and the book became Unholy Trinity. It's about the Vatican, the Nazis, and the Swiss banks. There's still scandals going on. 
I hope people understand that 99% of the Catholic Church had no involvement with this. This was a small group of right-wing, ultra-conservative Italian clerics um, who uh, disgraced the Catholic Church with uh, their attitudes both during and after the war. So the book was very controversial, but it's been published now in, I guess, 12 or 13 languages. And, uh, I think abroad it's published under the title Ratlines. It was made into a film over here. But that was sort of fun. But uh, you know, that's two books about Nazis. And you know, this was kind of interfering with my law practice. And let's face it, Nazi hunting is not exactly a growth industry, is it? <laughs> but by this time, I had become very friendly with a lot of men and women in the intelligence community. And they had sponsored me to join their retired spy clubs. <laughs> and I tried very politely to tell them to go away. I just didn't want to do this stuff anymore. And one day one of them said, John, you don't get it. If you think what we did with the Nazis was bad, let us tell you what we did to the Jews. I heard them out and I read their files. And one day I went home and told my wife I was leaving the practice of law. For the rest of my life, I was going to be the lawyer these men had to take a dollar from each of them and help these men and women get their stories told. You see, I believe that one third of the 20th century was classified. It's buried down in those vaults. So as a case study, I asked nearly 500 intelligence agents to tell me every dirty trick we ever pulled on Israel. That would be a nice little book. It ended up to be almost 700 pages. Don't worry, you don't have to read the whole book. Uh, we put bulleted paragraphs at the beginning of each chapter that summarizes it. So you can skim the whole book at 10 or 20 minutes. We did that for the press. <laughs> but uh, there is a theme to the book, and it's um, towards Israel. You know, what's our foreign policy towards Israel? Well, everyone knows. America's on Israel's side. We really are. We non-Jews, Republican, Democrat, we consistently keep electing congressmen and senators who support Israel's cause in the Middle East. We send more of our tax dollars to Israel than any other nation on earth. We're not the problem. The problem is that for the better part of the 20th century, our State Department and our intelligence community had a radically different foreign policy. They had said whatever we might say about liking the Jews in public, it really is in America's long-term national interest to obtain the cheap and consistent supply of oil. It's not about conspiracy. It's not about bigotry. It's about oil. It's about greed. If Moses had turned right and settled in Kuwait, <laughs> we probably would have made Israel the 51st state, but they had no oil. They had no oil, and part of the price that the Arab nations wanted us to pay was to give them intelligence assistance in their wars with Israel. And sad to say, American intelligence agreed. The bottom line was harsh. In every war that Israel fought, American intelligence fought on the Arab side. We wiretapped Israel's communications. We betrayed them to the Arabs. Um, probably the worst thing we ever did to Israel was the time we did nothing. And that happened in 1973. U.S. codebreakers had deciphered a Russian telegram from their embassy in Lebanon, and that telegram revealed to us the exact hours, dates, time, and place of an upcoming Arab sneak attack against Israel. The uh, implication was clear. Israel was about to be crushed under a wave of Arab military. A decision was made in the Nixon White House not to tell the Jews. You see, Henry Kissinger, although he was Jewish himself, was very angry at Israel at the time. Kissinger had been trying to put together a comprehensive Middle East peace solution, you know, keep the Arabs happy so the oil would flow. And the stiff-necked Israelis were whining about picky little details like security. So Kissinger was furious. He agreed that Israel should not be warned until the last hours or two before the attack. And even then, they would have to hold their lines and wait for the Arabs to fire the first shot. Now, the decision to hold information back caused an enormous amount of Israeli casualties. And Kissinger later 
discussed with one of his friends, that the idea was to let Israel, quote, get bloodied a little bit, but come out ahead. Kissinger wanted to slap the wrists of the Israeli leaders so they'd be more cooperative. Now, in addition, Kissinger went to the Secretary of Defense and he asked him to stall off sending any American supplies to Israel for the first seven days of the Yom Kippur War. Why seven days? Israel only had a seven-day battle stock of ammunition. And by the seventh day, uh, Kissinger predicted, the Israeli leaders would be on their knees ready to sign any piece of paper that Kissinger put in front of them, no matter how pro-Arab. But the Arabs would be happy and the oil would flow. Now, Kissinger wasn't a bigot. He wasn't even a particularly evil man. He was just a military incompetent. Kissinger didn't realize that his little pressure games weren't causing Israel to bleed a little bit. He started a hemorrhage that almost destroyed the nation. But luckily, there was one guy in the White House that saved Israel. No, it wasn't Richard Nixon. Don't even get me started on Richard Nixon. <laughs> You know, actually, in my own defense, when I first wrote this book, The Secret War Against the Jews, I got a great deal of flack, even from people in the Jewish community, because I said very clearly that President Richard Nixon was an extreme anti-Semite. No one believed it. And what happened last year? All the Nixon tapes were released from the National Archives. My favorite Nixon tape is where he turns to a friend of his in the Oval Office and said, you know, if I were to drop an atomic bomb on Tel Aviv, there would still be American Jews stupid enough to vote for me. <laughs> no, it's true. Nixon hated Jews. But luckily for Israel, Nixon was involved with the Watergate affair at the time. The guy that saved Israel was that heroic Republican, the White House Chief of Staff, General Alexander Haig. On the morning of the first day of the Yom Kippur War, General Haig called his Israeli counterpart and warned him of what Kissinger was up to. No supplies for seven days. It was a catastrophe. And then General Haig told the Israelis a secret. The U.S. Army had just perfected a new top secret weapon called the tow missile. Now, the tow missile is a dandy little toy. It's like a Nintendo game. You have these electronic binoculars attached to a cable in the back of the missile. And as the missile flies downrange, it unwinds almost two miles of cable behind it. So as you follow an enemy tank with your binoculars up and down hill and around a tree, you're actually steering the missile up and down hill and around a tree. And a 13-year-old kid can trace runaway enemy tanks at full speed and kill them 97 times out of 100. To this day, the tow missile is one of the deadliest anti-tank systems on the planet. Al Haig said he'd give the tow missile to Israel behind Kissinger's back. On the evening of the first day of the Yom Kippur War, an unmarked plane flew 41 Israeli army commanders to a secret base inside Fort Benning, Georgia. I know about this part of the story firsthand because I was there. You see, I was the young army officer who trained the Israelis in the tow missile system. We rushed the Israelis through a crash course at Fort Benning, and then we stripped every tow missile we had from the eastern seaboard of the U.S., and we flew them to Israel at night. As Oliver North later discovered, you can pack a lot of tow missiles into one or two aircraft. And at first, we thought the Israelis had screwed up. We wanted them to put the tow missiles at a defensive barrier around the major Israeli cities to save as many lives as possible. And instead, those crazy Jews took all of the tow missiles and dumped them at two spots out in the desert. And they were right. Israeli intelligence knew that the entire Egyptian tank army was about to come roaring up the Sinai for the final assault on Israel. But all of those hundreds and hundreds of Egyptian tanks and armored personnel carriers would have to go through either the Mitla or the Gitla Pass. And when they did, the tow missiles were waiting just in time. They had just arrived a few hours earlier. It was one of the greatest tank slaughters in modern military history. But to protect Al Haig, the government of Israel told you a cover story. They told you that the Israeli Air Force had blown up all those hundreds of Egyptian tanks. Hmm, that's good shooting. <laughs> so good, in fact, the American Air Force got jealous. The U.S. government actually sent a team of uh, American officers to Israel to walk the battlefield. But there was a problem. They couldn't find any holes on the tops of the Egyptian tanks. They hadn't been hit from the sky at all. They'd been blown up from the side. That was the first combat deployment of the tow missile. 
And I tell that story to illustrate that sometimes American Jews don't know who your friends are and who your enemies are. One of the old spies said that Henry Kissinger should be compelled to change his religious affiliation from Jewish to self-promotion. <laughs> that may be a bit unfair to poor Henry, who was, after all, only following a consistent American diplomatic policy of siding with the Arabs. In the long run, it was about money. There's a, a few pages in my book, The Secret War Against the Jews, that talked about an unusual banking system some of my intelligence friends had stumbled across. I'm going to break a major news story today with you. It seems that during World War II, the leading Nazi industrialists secretly owned a bank in New York City. That bank was dissolved in 1951. However, the records are clear. The Nazi bank in Manhattan was run by President Bush's father, Prescott Bush, and by Herbert Walker, his grandfather. The Bush family was on the wrong side of World War II. Now, we need to put this in perspective. These are serious, serious charges. We have them. Uh, the ownership of the Nazi bank proved from three different sources. The Bush membership in the board of that bank is a matter of public record. Let's put it back in context. After World War I, the leading German steel magnate, August Thyssen, was very upset because the Allies seized some of his companies for war reparations. And he was determined never to have this happen in the next war. So he set up a series of banks, one in Berlin, named after himself the August Thyssen Bank, one in Holland, which had been neutral during World War II, that was the Bank wo Schiebwald und Handel, and then a bank in Manhattan, the Union Banking Corp. So no matter which side won the next war, his corporations could move their stocks and bonds from one bank to the other. Now, he, he even trained his two sons that they would have to preserve the family business in the next war. So he told one son that he would be a Nazi and the other son that he would be a neutral. So no matter which side won the war, the Tissons would win. Now, the first thing the Tisson family needed was money. So they went to a major investment firm, Brown Brothers Harriman in Manhattan. Now, this firm was, was founded by Herbert Walker, and um, he merged with a British firm, Brown Brothers, with a, a major Democratic firm, Harriman. The Democrats have their own scandal here as well. Averill Harriman's brother, Roland Harriman, was also on the board. It is a matter of public record that Brown Brothers Harriman helped American investors move billions of dollars into Germany during the 20s and 30s. The German currency was worthless, but German stock was worth a fortune because Germany had almost a high-tech patent monopoly on all these advanced trade processes. So the Brown Brothers Harriman helped organize the flow of money into Germany from some famous American families like the Rockefellers, the Fords, and the DuPonts. Now, none of these people, the Bushes, the Fords, the Rockefellers, were pro-Nazi. They actually favored the conservative uh, monarchist and Catholics party in Germany. But they did fund Hitler as a side bet, because he was useful to keep the unions at bay. So in 1923, money flowed from Brown Brothers Harriman in New York to the, the, the Dutch bank to Berlin. Now, we have traced from the Dutch bank directly to the Nazi party headquarters. That's where the money came from to build the very first Nazi party headquarters, the Brown House in Munich. Fritz Thyssen later admitted that he was the man who financed Hitler's first campaign. The Thyssen family were the great steel and coal combines of Germany. They were the heart of the Third Reich's armament industry. They were actually larger and wealthier than the, the famous Krupp family, but the Tissen name was kept quiet. Now, as Hitler came to power, the Tissens were making a fortune. But the problem was they were a little concerned that Hitler would push the German economy to its limits and cause a great deal of inflation. So the Tissens betrayed Hitler. They started to move their money out in the 30s. In essence, it was a huge tax fraud. They would sell one of their companies, for example, the Holland America Investment Company, 
to the Bushes, supposedly a, a neutral bank in New York, not knowing that the Tissons secretly owned both banks. It looked like the Tissons were losing money. So the Bushes would buy the banks, the, uh, the companies from the Tissons, and they'd set up American branches. And Prescott Bush was the head of uh, several of the companies that were actually directly owned by the Tisson, Tisson people. Now, Hitler suspected that uh, the, the Tissons were cheating him right and left. And Tisson was smart. By the time that Hitler declared war on Poland, Tisson figured the game was up, and he fled the country and proclaimed himself to be an anti-Nazi. The truth was he was making profit on both sides, as were the Rockefellers, as were the Fords and DuPonts and Bushes. To be fair, once they had invested in Germany, what they were going to do? They couldn't emigrate with a steel mill. Their money was trapped there. So rather than take the loss, some very greedy people made a war, made a war profit. And while American and British soldiers died, they were making millions. The, to hide his records from the British, Tissen moved them to the Dutch brank during World War II. Now, when the Nazis overran Holland, the Tissen had to hide the records again, so they moved them back to the August Tissen Bank in Berlin because there had been a Nazi custodian appointed who was actually another Tissen employee. So they hid all the secret stock ownerships for the New York Bank and the Dutch Bank and they hid all the bank accounts in these underground vaults in the Thyssen Bank in Berlin. Now, the U.S. government was also studying the matter, and our alien property custodians decided that this little New York bank that the Bushes ran was the subsidiary of a Dutch bank. And once the Dutch overran Holland, it was a Nazi bank. So believe it or not, the U.S. government quietly seized President Bush's father and grandfather's business holdings as Nazi fronts. These properties were quietly returned after the war, because after all, they were just Dutch banks. When the Dutch got their bank back, so did the Bushes. Of course, it wasn't a Dutch bank at all. It never was. It was always, always secretly owned by the leading Nazi industrialists in Europe. The uh, comic opera continued in 1951, the Allied investigators finally gave up trying to find the missing Tissen money. Fritz Tissen, the Nazi brother, was actually held in an American prison in Germany for more than four years. And we grilled him, where did the money go? He said, oh, the Nazis took all my money. You know, I don't own anything anymore. You know, it all went out to relatives and things. I don't have anything. So he was lying through his teeth. He said, I don't have any foreign bank accounts. Well, that was technically true. We didn't have foreign bank accounts. He owned foreign banks. So one of the reasons that uh, Tissen got away with it was that he had a very good lawyer. And his lawyer was Alan Dulles. Now, Alan Dulles was in charge of US intelligence investigations in Germany after the war. It was very convenient, because Alan Dulles was also the lawyer for the Tissens, and also the lawyer for the Bushes. The law firm of Sullivan Cromwell, to which Alan Dulles and his brother belonged, was actually the law firm that handled most of these bank transactions and set up the companies. They were the people who helped direct American investment in Germany during the 20s and 30s. And now it was up to the Dulles brothers to help their clients get their money back. In particular, the Rockefellers had a huge chunk of money in Brown Brothers Harriman, which the Bushes had invested in the Thyssen Empire. And the Rockefellers had no sense of humor about going broke. They wanted their money back. And so in 1951, everything had quieted down. Alan Dulles and his brother were about to become members of the Eisenhower administration. The New York bank that the Bushes ran was quietly liquidated. Now the Bush, Prescott Bush and Walker, each got one share of stock worth three quarters of a million dollars. So the Bush family took out $1.5 million in 1951 dollars. That's where the Bush family fortune came from. It came from the Third Reich, right? Now, is it blood money? Yes, the Tissons were among the largest slave holders in the Nazi empire. They, uh, they used that huge coal mines where they used Jewish slave laborers as if they were disposable chemicals. Um, the Tisson steel was the, the United Steel, the Reinigte Stahlwerke was the heart of the Nazi war machine. 
but they all got their money back. After the war, the Tissons slowly brought the money out of hiding from New York and Argentina, and they began to rebuild. In 1971, they merged with another bank and formed the Tisson Born Missa Group. Chase Manhattan Bank in New York owns 31% of this holding company. It's now worth $50 billion. So all the poor Jewish survivors in American POWs are trying to sue the Swiss banks when the Bush family may have laundered more money than all the Swiss banks combined. The Tissen Born Missa Group consists of assets that were Nazi assets and fraudulently hidden from both the U.S. and British governments. There's no question about this because the U.S. and British interrogation files are in our national archives. Now, I happen to have written a bit about the Bush family's connection with Union Bank because I was tipped off. And in my book, The Secret War Against the Jews, I repeated this curious charge that the, book, the Bush family had been on the board of directors of these curious entities that seemed to have invested in Nazi Germany. Well, really, to be fair to the Bushes, they had just simply invested in the 20s before Hitler really came to power. You know, it was not a crime, maybe it wasn't moral to invest, invest in Nazi Germany, but before America became involved in war, it wasn't illegal. But after the war, you know, it seems that young George Bush, who later became president, dropped out of Yale because he knew that in a week his father's firms were going to be seized as Nazi fronts. And young George Bush uh, wanted to enlist in the military to save the family honor. The younger Bush generations, I think, have a, a, a great deal of credit to their names and have indeed done America proud. I mean, but let's be fair, no one blames the Democrats because Jack Kennedy's dad bought Nazi stocks. How many people here knew that Joseph Kennedy invested in Nazi Germany? See, everyone knows that. How many of you knew before today that the Bush family ran a Nazi bank. Okay. Now, we haven't released this before the election. This has got to come out because it's much more important than just whether you know Pre Prescott Bush's grandson uh, runs for office. This whole issue of being able to hide money through multinational shells has a direct effect on our political system. It's not just a question of double punching ballots. The more important question is. Who's funding our political campaigns? Perhaps there are only rumors, but the allegations that I have received from the intelligence community are that the Thyssen family are the secret sources of that slush fund in Germany that Helmut Kohl uh, refuses to disclose where the money's from. That they were the secret financial backers of their neighbor in London. They live right across the street from Margaret Thatcher. And that the Thyssens and their business partners, the Rockefellers, have been the Wall Street ring of the Republican Party financing candidates for the last 40 years in the U.S. That there was this almost bottomless slush fund of campaign money. There are numerous Tyson outlets in the U.S., so legally Tyson employees in America can donate money to political campaigns. And I don't know if we will ever know how much of that money was actually donated by Tyson employees and how much was reimbursed from abroad. Reimbursements from abroad are, of course, a felony. Foreign corporations may not contribute to American things. So perhaps when we sit down in Congress in a few weeks and begin to debate how best to reform our ballot counting system, we should also take a look at campaign finance reform. You know, if there's one thing that all of us, Republicans and Democrats, can agree on is that Nazis are bad. And we have always suspected that someone was pulling strings. And I think what we have had is a series of multinational corporations behaving like pirates. And they have no ideology. They don't care about America. They don't care about Nazi Germany. They only care about money. But what do I care? I'm not a Jew. Uh, none of my family died in the Holocaust. I don't have any relatives in Israel. Why give up a great legal career to go around writing history books. Not only is it not profitable, it's like doing homework for the rest of your life. <laughs> well, I have a personal reason for staying with this subject and being the president of the Florida Holocaust Museum. That's sort of fun. If you haven't been to see us, we just built the fifth 
largest Holocaust museum in the world in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I missed a meeting and they made me president. That's what happens. <laughs> but we're investing a quarter million dollars here in Sarasota to open up a branch of the museum. And we're opening, investing a quarter of a million dollars. In January, we'll have America's largest website so that every child in America can take one of these high-tech virtual reality tours of our museum. And they can walk from room to room, 360-degree views, and, and actually meet with a Holocaust survivor and type in questions and get answers. So kids can learn a little bit about character education, about tolerance, about racial prejudice, about World War II, about the Holocaust. Because we need to do a better job, a job of teaching our children. But as for me, I have a personal reason for staying on this subject. See, when I was down in those intelligence vaults, I came across a manuscript that would change my life. It was written by a Jew. His name was Saul Schnadow. Saul lived in that little borderland between Poland and Russia. Today we call it Belarus, but in those days before World War II, the Jews called it the Pale, the Pale of Settlement. There used to be a 70-mile wide strip of land along the Russian borders where Jews had been allowed to live for three centuries. And you could go from Vilna to Minsk to Baranovich to Pinsk all the way down to Romania. And some of these cities and towns were 90% Jewish. The Pale was the most densely populated Jewish settlement on the face of the earth. And unfortunately for them, it lay right smack in the middle of Hitler's invasion path for Russia. Now when the armies of the Third Reich came pouring through, they didn't have enough German soldiers to take care of this huge Jewish population. So the SS asked the local Christian population for volunteers. And sad to say, there's always 1% in every country, including ours, who would volunteer to climb the power over the bodies of children if necessary. Now the volunteer that came to be in charge of Saul's life was a man named Dr. Stankovich, a doctor of humanities, which is rather ironic to the Jews, because they soon identified Dr. Stankovich as the inventor of the sardine method of execution. Dr. Stankovich would have his police force drag the Jewish families out to a road where ditches had been dug. They were forced at gunpoint to disrobe. Then they had to climb in the ditches and lay on top of each other head to toe. That way, Stankovich's police could shoot through a double layer of bodies and save ammunition. You know, a bullet cost one mark, 25 cents. So they would shuffle a layer of dirt over the dead and wounded, a double layer of bodies, a layer of dirt, and so on, and so on. Now the worst part of the sardine method wasn't even discovered until after World War II, when American Red Cross doctors were conducting autopsies on the graves. They could find no evidence of wounds upon the smallest victims. Apparently, to save the price of a bullet, Dr. Stankovich ordered that the babies be buried alive. As a reward for his efficiency, the SS promoted Dr. Stankovich and made him the governor of the entire province of Baranovich, where Saul lived. There were 50,000 Jews in the Baranovich ghetto on the day that Dr. Stankovich arrived. Six months later, there were 5,000 Jews. Six months after that, only 500 Jews were kept alive as skilled laborers in Dr. Stankovich's concentration camp. Now, Saul was the camp barber. Saul had lost his wife, his three kids, all 110 members of his family. Now think about that. Every relative, every friend, every face he had known on the face of the earth had been murdered. And this little Jewish barber did an amazing thing. He dug a tunnel under a Nazi concentration camp and led the last 126 Jews in a breakout. They made it to the swamps and forests of Belarusia. They joined up with other Jewish fugitives, but they didn't run away. They formed a Jewish resistance brigade, a partisan brigade, Bielski's brigade. Hundreds of miles behind Nazi lines, this tiny group of Jewish men and women, most of them teenagers, early 20s, they took up arms and went back and fought against the men that had slaughtered their families. The Jewish women in particular were so adept at blowing up railway lines, they were crippling Hitler's supply trains, trying to reach the Eastern Front. They were changing the course of the war. Stankovich put a price of 10,000 marks on Saul's head. Six of the Belarus SS police battalions were assigned to track the Jews down. At the end of World War II, Bielski's brigade was the most highly decorated partisan unit on the entire Eastern Front, but there were only a few dozen survivors. Saul was one of them. 
At the end of the war, Saul had remarried a young woman whose life he'd saved in the camp, and she was pregnant. Saul didn't want to have a, his child grow up under communism. So he and his young bride took up their arms again. They shot their way across the Russian border, escaped across Central Europe, and eventually emigrated to the United States. And when he got here, Saul settled in central New Jersey, but he didn't put the past behind him. He sat down and wrote out his history his, of the 50,000 Jews from his little corner of the world who would never be able to speak for themselves. And proudly, Saul sent a copy to the U.S. government. And someone, somewhere in our State Department, stamped Saul's manuscript secret. And they hid it down the nuclear vault with the Nazi files. You know why? As one of their anti-communist agents, the British Secret Service had recruited Dr. Stankovich. It gets worse. The British asked us to hide him, and we did. We brought Dr. Stankovich to New York City and gave him a job as a broadcaster at Radio Liberty. Your tax dollars at work. Please remember it was the McCarthy era. No one believed these crazy commie charges about war criminals in America. And Stankovich played them like a flute. By 1952, he had resettled virtually the entire Nazi puppet government of Belarusia to the town of South River, New Jersey. I couldn't believe the files. I actually took some federal bodyguards and went to see South River one night. You know, they have a private cemetery for the Belarus SS. And inside the cemetery is the monument engraved the Nazi president. Behind their local church, they have a monument to their SS division. And you know the worst thing about South River, New Jersey? All this time, Saul had been living less than a half an hour away. And I thought, what a tragedy. Here is this heroic Jew who fought against the Nazis and the communists and came to America to find freedom only to end up living in the shadow of the men who murdered his own babies. What would you do? Well, maybe I am a thick-headed Irishman, but I went to the Assistant Attorney General of the United States and I asked for permission to prosecute a British intelligence agent as a Nazi war criminal. I showed him the Stankovich file. Permission was granted. Secretly, I asked all the U.S. agencies to put a trace out for Saul Schnadow as a key witness in the future trial of Dr. Stankovich. But all the agencies reported back, negative, no trace. Saul was missing and in view of his age had to be presumed dead. It was terribly sad, but it didn't stop our trial preparations. I had my staff round up every Nazi document in the world that even mentioned Dr. Stankovich. It really was an enormous research job. And you know, Dr. Stankovich was ungrateful enough to drop dead on me two weeks before we could file charges against him. He died peacefully in his bed, a citizen of the United States. There was a big sigh of relief over the British Embassy. And the British government asked the new Reagan administration, which had just come in, not to let me investigate any more cases like that. Much too embarrassing to the British government. Because if they open up the Nazi files, that's going to lead to the Vatican, then you're going to have to deal with the Nazi gold and, and where the Nazi money went. And that would lead back to Americans as well as British. So, you know, the British said, use our 75-year censorship rule. We won't release any of the Nazi files for 75 years. So I was ordered by the U.S. government for reasons of foreign policy to stay out of the vaults and forget what I had seen. But how? How do you forget about someone like Saul? I told the Reagan administration that I would not participate in a cover-up. And I sat down and wrote out the manuscript to my first book. And I dedicated it to Saul, a Jew who bore witness to the Holocaust, and to Meg, my newborn, so that she may never have to. That's why I did it. I did it for our kids, for all our kids. That's why I volunteered my time at the Florida Holocaust Museum. We have to make the world a better, safer place for our children. And that means in some small part that people like me have to dig out the ugly truth. And we all of us have to recognize that the truth is more important than politics. We need to regain control of our history. We cannot live in a world where one third of our modern history is classified. In the end, I remain optimistic, very optimistic about America. I guess I am still at heart an Eagle Scout. And some good things have happened. When we went to build our Holocaust Museum, 
We smuggled a boxcar out of Poland. Um, it's the only one the Polish government hasn't cleaned up for us. And when we were setting the car up inside the museum, we found something horrible inside. Maybe something wonderful. We found a little girl's ring. Now, all that we know for sure from the silver marks inside is that ring existed at about the time of the Holocaust. And we know that there were once five jewels of some kind that had been set in the ring. And we know that the ring would fit the hand of a, about a 14-year-old girl. That's all that we really know for sure, but you know what happened. Fifty years ago, somewhere in Europe, a little girl took the jewels out of her ring to try and ransom her survival. And one day, as she was riding in that boxcar, she realized that for her there would be no survival. And for whatever reason, with that little empty ring with all the jewels gone, it was still valuable to her, and she didn't want the Nazis to get it, so she took it off her hand and put it in a crack in the floorboard and hammered it in with her heel. And she did it so no one would find it. And 50 years later, by a miracle, we picked that boxcar to bring to St. Petersburg, Florida. The little girl's ring is mounted outside. As we take the school kids through, we teach them a story of hope. It's, ours is not a sad museum. There are no atrocity foes. But kids need to understand the past to prevent it from happening. And when we show them the little girl's ring, we say, you know, don't be sad that we don't know that little girl's name, and don't be sad that all the jewels are lost. Because the jewels aren't lost. You are the jewels. All of you who care about the jewels of justice, of memory, of understanding, of tolerance, you are the gems of American society. And people like you preserve the truth, preserve our history. Because the most important thing that I learned from Saul was that in this country, you should never be afraid to speak the truth. Thank you for listening.